Shanti 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 Hello and welcome beautiful souls. I'm so glad you're here joining us today. This is another episode of Cosmic Convos, a place where we can gather and explore and learn from amazing visionaries and healers and spiritual teachers and learn how they connect with consciousness and how they connect with the cosmos. So thank you for joining today. I am here with a great hero of mine, my Reiki hero, my beloved mentor, Franz Stina, the author of many amazing Reiki books. So we have the book that started it all out for me, Reiki source book, which all Reiki teachers, I feel need to check this one out. This is a good uh, like reference, just so many different techniques, just so beautiful. Then we have the inner heart of Reiki, which is actually my favorite book by Franz. Uh, absolutely amazing book. And then the new book, The Way of Reiki, which just came out a few months ago and is continues to deepen the teachings of Reiki and help so many Reiki practitioners around the world. Franz Stina is uh, based in Holland and he is the founder of the International House of Reiki. He travels all over the world uh, sharing trainings and meditations and spiritual teachings with seekers. So Franz, thank you so much for joining Cosmic Combos today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Really looking forward to it. Yay. <laughs> so, so Reiki is your path. This is what you teach. And I'm curious, was Reiki the first spiritual path that you came across or did you um, explore different spiritual paths or different traditions before you came into Reiki? And then how did you come into the Reiki path? What was the way that it magnetized you in? Um, it was one of the very early ones I touched upon. Uh, I read a few books about different teachings. Uh, I wasn't really, I was living in that time in India and uh, I lived there for two years and I wasn't really, when I moved to India, I wasn't really into any spiritual practices and at such. So uh, yeah, it was really interesting. I had a spiritual experience or a direct experience with a healer in the Himalayas and uh, that really triggered something deep inside me to look for who I really am and, and the mysteries of life. And by coincidence, or well, coincidence, mm -hmm. I found a Reiki book. And uh, in that, it was really focused on hands-on healing. So just I remember starting to hands-on healing on myself. And then I lived in Nepal and did a Reiki 1, 2, and 3 class there, the first one of many. And uh, yeah, I really feel, felt like a shift within myself and then slowly started to explore that. And I thought, well, if I can do it, who's always very skeptical, maybe I should also help people to really make sure that they can really find that innate healing power within themselves. Mm -hmm. So initially, as many people and myself included, you know, we come to the Reiki path thinking like, well, being very inspired by hands-on healing and, and, and the physical body healing. So, um, and then it seems like what happens for many of us is we then realize, wow, Reiki is so much more than that. Um, so could you tell me about your experience of starting to realize that there was so much more to Reiki than hands-on healing? Uh, well, the first thing I really learned when I first studied the system of Reiki was very externalized. But at that time, because I was living in India and in Nepal, I had a lot of free time. So I started to do lots of hands-on healing on myself in a, in a slightly different way than I was taught. Uh, I did it in a very meditative way and not like, oh, you just can lay down and fall asleep. And then I started to use these symbols and mantras also more and more internally. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that, A, my mind became calmer. And then also my body felt much better. I used to suffer from a lot of back problems since I was 16. 
And uh, so, yeah, that really triggered lots of different layers. So I started to really see a difference within myself, in my mind, in my body and energy. And uh, then when I started to look at these, the concept of hands-on healing, particularly when I started to live in Darjeeling, there's a lot of healers around Darjeeling and in Darjeeling of many different traditions. And one thing they all had in common, and that was their own very serious meditation practices. And that was not really taught within the system of Reiki that I learned at that time. So I became intrigued by that because the quality of people's hands-on healing there in those traditions was mind-blowing and <laughs> was so much more deeper and in-depth and had such a more in-depth repercussion of my mind, body, and energy than I would experience of a Reiki practitioner or a teacher. And so in 2001, I started to go to Japan and rediscovered actually that traditionally there were indeed lots of meditation practices mm -hmm. in the system of Reiki to facilitate that. And, and when actually the system of Reiki came to the West and already in Japan itself, uh, those practices became hardly emphasized or not taught at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is what I appreciate so much about your work, because when I, I think it was, yeah, the first book was the Reiki source book that I read from you. And I felt, um, or no, maybe it was the inner heart of Reiki. I think it was the inner heart of Reiki. It, you explained that, like how important meditation is to mm. the path and that myself was not emphasized in my training and um it was kind of mind-blowing for me like wow oh meditation oh okay and yes granted we could say that hands-on healing is a form of meditation right but then there's many other practices within the system of reiki as well um, and i also really appreciate how you always emphasize the system of Reiki, like instead of just saying the word Reiki, because I think yeah. people get confused, like what is that? Maybe it means just energy, or maybe it means the path, or maybe it means like enlightenment, or like what um in your in your understanding of the word Reiki, um, could you talk a little bit about the evolution of your understanding of like literally like what that word means? Yeah, traditionally, from a Japanese perspective, uh, I trained since 2012 with a Japanese priest uh, in a little temple. It's absolutely quite interesting. He's 70 now. And um, yeah, from their perspective, Reiki means your true nature, your essence, Buddha nature, Kami, whatever word we stick on it, um, that ultimately we cannot word it. You know, it's not... Uh, as soon as we stick a word on it, we almost stick it in a box already. Yeah. And then we get a bit confused. But so it's really your your true essence, your true nature, your true self. And then we have the system of Reiki, what helps you to lay bare that true nature. So the system of Reiki traditionally consists of hands-on healing, meditation practices, precepts, symbols and mantras, and something what we now call achievement or initiation, but traditionally is called Reiju. And by practicing those five elements of the system of Reiki, slowly, slowly, we start to realize that we already Reiki. We've always been Reiki. It's not something external of you. We always are this beautiful, great luminosity. And then, of course, we can carry that with us in our daily life. But now when we say the word Reiki, most people, they think, oh, it's hands-on healing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's so much more, in fact. And that is something what I try to teach uh, worldwide to show people that actually it is so much more. And in a way, we can see this now, for example, if I type in yoga on Instagram, it's more aerobics, but actually yoga was so much more than a physical posture, it was a state of mind, a state of mind of the yogi or yogini, what resided in this non-dual mindset. And then you were a yogi or a yogini, not if you could do a wonderful posture. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, all of these teachings, I think, have uh, 
uh, for a lot of practices, unfortunately, we lose these roots, you know, where what is really the reason why we practice it and what is the emphasis and emphasis and where can it take us, you know, and I think that is really important. Absolutely. Um, so I'm a practitioner of yoga as well. And lately I've been thinking about this concept of the Kali Yuga, which is this idea that we are currently living in very difficult times as humans, and that a lot of the ancient truth, a lot of the ancient wisdom has been lost. And what I see happening right now is that we are, as a as a global culture, um, dipping our toes into like the ancient wisdom. So yes, like yoga is seen as exercise for now. And yeah. right now, like everyone thinks, Ooh, I'm going to like heal everyone with my magic hands. And it's like, okay, cool. That's the beginning start, you know? Um, so, so it's like, first we uncover like maybe the like slightly, well, this is this the, um, not, not so much the deeper layers right now in the mainstream, yeah. but that over time that will also come up for, for more people. I think so. You know, the more we apply it, and I, I hear this a lot of people when they rediscover my books, for example, and I said, oh, this is what I've been experiencing already. But my teachers or when I read on the internet, I don't read about it or they can't help me. And so when they read more about these deeper layers of the system of Reiki, it makes sense because it's something that through the practice, they slowly start to lay bare themselves. It's not really an intellectual exercise, but a really embodiment of this luminosity within themselves. Yeah, uh, that's another wonderful thing I so appreciate about your teachings is the emphasis, constant emphasis on the body wisdom, um, particularly yeah. the Hada. And how that, I mean, I'm a part of your email daily list. And I think, I don't know, a, a lot of days you send out quotes about the Hara. Like, and yeah. it, it's, so could you explain a little bit about the Hara and about just how more about how the body critically factors into the system of Reiki? Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting. This morning I went to a little cafe and, and there was a friend, a recently new friend who I know just because we meet up in a cafe and, and that's about it. And <laughs> she felt, she was saying that she just had done some some type of yoga and that she felt very ungrounded in it uh, in the last week and that, that really uh, she felt she would become more sensitive at work and therefore it was difficult to do her work. She works in the mm -hmm. health industry. And so I was talking about, you know, bringing it into your body and yeah. because the body needs to be stable, you know, like for me, spirituality is not zoning out of the body or daydreaming or being like, like that, that is wonderful, but it's, it's that way we cannot take it into our daily life. And in a lot of these teachings, uh, in yoga, Tai Chi, Chi Kung, the system of Reiki, the first point of call is really touching your body or using your body mm -hmm. to make sure that we are anchored in the body, that we feel very stable and sensitive and grounding. And in all of these traditions, we work with an area what is around the navel area. So we can say the root chakra or the heart or the dan chen or the navel chakra, but more lower in the body than up here. Mm -hmm. Because when, when we really feel this openness up here, but there is nothing down there, mm -hmm. then we like an upside down pyramid and we become very unbalanced and therefore very difficult to take that state of mind into our daily life. But if we were very grounded and very wide here, like a mountain, we become very, very stable, like a solid mountain. And then we can really deal with the difficulty of daily life. And uh, in Japan, it's really wonderful because uh, the symbology, I mean, there's two different elements, even the teachers really going into the mountains. Like when I go to my teacher in Japan, we go into the mountains. And uh, his little temple is also in the mountains. So we go into the mountains, we practice. And when you really do this, 
then hopefully we have a direct experience that we are the mountain and then we can come down from the mountain into the towns, into the villages, into mm. the big cities to help people. Mm. Uh, but if we feel very quickly overwhelmed, then it becomes very difficult to help other people. And therefore very important that grounding and centering specifically these days, because we are so in our head, we're constantly analyzing, constantly overthinking, we're stimulated by computers, phones, all situated around here, you know, also headphones, mm -hmm. you name it. And traditionally, a lot of these ancient wisdom came from people who were naturally already very grounded and centered because they were not so distracted as we are in mm. our modern life. So some of the practices, mm. of these ancient practices might not have started with grounding because they were already so grounded. So there was no need for it. But in these modern days, we're definitely not grounded. So we cannot just take a lot of these ancient teachings and then apply them, we actually have to look at where they come from and then how can we integrate them into our life? What is the difference? What is the same? And therefore, for most of these, we still really have to work first very solidly, maybe for some years to really go into the body. I love that. Um, I was thinking too, maybe part of why they were grounded these ancient teachers maybe perhaps was that um they lived closer to nature so they Absolutely. were more like in the elements and things were just simpler yeah yeah things were simpler and you know if, 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 imagine already we see this for ourselves already we say oh let's go and walk in nature but already implement <laughs> that that we are not nature ourselves, mm -hmm. right? We have to walk in it somewhere, somewhere over there. Yeah. And yet for them, those old teachers, they say, no, we are nature. We are not separate from nature. So we already see that we are very disconnected the way we talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to dive into your new book, The Way of Reiki. Um, the subtitle is The Inner Teachings of Mikasui. And um, I'm curious, I'm curious your inner evolutionary process that brought you to, to this teaching, um, because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this was the one you wrote right before this, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, and this book, I mean, this book, I recommend the inner heart of Reiki to all my Reiki students. I feel that this, even at level one, um, you know, yeah. just go for it because why wait <laughs> to get deep, you know? Um, <laughs> so, but what was your evolutionary process where this, this, it's not, you couldn't even say new teaching because it's just, it's ancient wisdom of non-duality. Yeah. Um, but, but how, what was, what were you learning? What was um, what guided you to this new expression of teaching? Well, I think it's a really good question. So after I wrote the Inner Heart of Reiki, I started to do more training with my teacher in Japan, and uh, his teachings and his tradition is very much about that direct experience. You go and sit on your butt. You start at four in the morning till about midnight have a little sleep and then start again. And you do this for seven days or two weeks. <laughs> so, and then, you know, you get practices home, what you have to do very seriously. And because if you come back and you don't know these practices and you cannot do it, then they kick you out of the temple. They said, it's a waste of my time. Yeah. You don't know it. Uh, you don't know it by heart. Uh, so off you go. So it's a, it's a very dedicated practice. And through these teachings and dedicated practices, I started to have much more insight into Mikasui's teachings. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like an evolutionary process. You know, I think it's the same when we, for example, practice the yoga for a long time. We start to maybe feel different layers within our body, within our mind, within our energy. And we say, okay, this book was more the basis, this is a little bit deeper. Now we can even go deeper. Mm. And, and so in that way, 
uh, I really felt the need to write those teachings down of uh, the last years of my life, of this moment, um, to help other people in that part to really rediscover that too. Because for me, ultimately, it's about a way of life, that we can lead a way of life with less anger, less worry, being grateful, being true to our way in a being and compassionate. And I think that is definitely needed as you say, Kali yoga or yoga these days. So it's uh, needed in our modern day life that we can embody compassion and kindness more and more on and on a deeper level. Yeah. What was the most striking thing or one of the most striking things that came through in terms of your deepening understanding of the precepts as you were working with this book? Yeah, for me, all the precepts have always been the core and the foundation of the system of Reiki. And I think if we, you know, if we look at the basic layer, for example, of the precepts, then we say, do not anger, do not worry, be grateful, be true to your way and your being and show compassion to yourself and others. But that is just a basic, right? If we look deeper, then, for example, uh, we can ask ourselves, well, who is angry? Oh, I am angry. And then who is this I? Can I find this I? If so, where is it to be found? If what if it can't find the I, then what happens? And it is not just a, a one-minute intellectual uh, experience, but we have to do this again and again and again over many, many, many sessions yeah. so that we know 100% that either we can find it or not find the I. <laughs> and so... Same, for example, with compassion. I, I hear a lot of people, oh, I'm very kind. And then the next moment, they're not kind. So it's a kindness what changes constantly. Like, oh, now I'm really kind. Now I'm not so kind. So now I'm really kind to Anya. And then next week, you say something and suddenly I'm not so kind to you anymore. So because depending on circumstances, that kindness changes. But what if there is a kindness what doesn't change according to circumstances? Can we tap into this? And that is ultimately what all of these spiritual teachings talk about. Where is this kindness what doesn't change according to circumstances? And how can we lay this bare? And that really is uh, interwoven within the system of Reiki uh, in a more deeper layer. And that for me, I find much more so important than hands-on healing. Hands-on healing on other people is great, but it's mm -hmm. it's kind of limiting. I cannot walk around town and go like this, <laughs> but I can walk as much as possible in this luminosity of a compassion what doesn't change according to circumstances. Yeah. Your teacher that you study with and um, that you visit, um, what, I'm just curious, this is just a little minute detail, but what um does he actually like think of his teachings as the system of reiki or does he more say he's a buddhist teacher or i'm just curious what his lineage is <laughs> uh he tries as much as possible not to give it a specific name yeah. oh uh, because for them also, uh, I think this is wonderful when we look at the concept of light, right? Mm -hmm. In a lot of these teachings, like in the system of Reiki, we talk about great bright light. The word Christ means light. Uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, clear light, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in Taoism, they talk about luminosity. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we cannot stick a label on this light. Like this light is not necessarily Tibetan or Japanese or mm -hmm. Christian or any kind of, as soon as we say that we already limit its light. Yes. And therefore, for my teacher, it's very much to that is uh, as much as possible. For example, if I ask him, what does the word Reiki means? He would say that means Kami or Buddha nature, and then he said, don't get distracted by these words, Franz, you mm. know, because <laughs> these words can be very distracting because mm. then we, we limit it. We say, oh, Kami is different than Buddha nature or Buddha nature is suddenly different than light. 
But that is not really true. They're just different words for the same kind of thing. What is ultimately that unchanging love and compassion. And I like really this. Uh, I also studied Taoism a long time ago with a Taoist teacher. And she was quite amazing. And she also never tried to stick words on it. Uh, because also in Taoism, you have this wonderful phrase, if you can name the Tao, it's not the Tao anymore. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and, and I really like this because as soon yep. as we we confine it into something specific yep. and then we are already limited. Uh, for example, in Zen Buddhism, there is a, a saying, if you see Buddha, kill him. <laughs> and, and what they really mean by that is if you see Buddha and you see still something as external, I am seeing Buddha as something externally in a very dualistic way, then you have to kill that dualistic way. You have to realize you are Buddha and you are Buddha and everything is Buddha. And therefore it ceases to be called Buddha in a way. That's one of the things I like really feel. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed with the profundity of how fast Reiki is spreading in our world right now, mm -hmm. because I think what Reiki helps people to do is to really see that there is no difference between me and Buddha. There is no difference between me and Christ, because I think for, you know, however long many thousands of years humans have placed god or or whatever higher power up you know on a throne in the sky and made this like separation like which is also can be beautiful in its certain ways too but um, worship is beautiful to do but also like there's that been that separation and i think reiki for so many people is this glimmer like maybe the first glimmer and it was for me of like oh i am that yeah and it's so accessible um and again like people come into it with the you know maybe wanting to heal like an illness or uh, like some kind of mental imbalance or something but then they're like hold on a second like oh i am that light it's like i i had this um I'm actually working on a Reiki book right now and I was writing and it came through last night about um, like how, you know, we talk, at least I teach for many years I've taught, you know, okay, you channel the, the energy in through the crown mm -hmm. and then blah, 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 which is all true on a certain level. But then it's starting to dawn on me that even that way of conceptualizing it is separating me from the energy imagining that it's coming from outside of me it's like it is me yeah it is you, you know? <laughs> and that that is the whole point it's a little bit like this you know normally we see the inside of the glass is very different than the outside of the glass but when we smash the ego the eye then we realize inside outside we cannot separate anymore and uh, but the first point of call is really going within. And also, you know, I think one reason we find so difficult to go within, because that's where we've stored our trauma, our issues, our anger, our worry, etc. So when we go within these healing practice and we have to go within, we have to face this shit. And so mm -hmm. this is sometimes where healing practices now have become a certain escape of actually facing that. Um, but actually we, then we never clear up things, you know, it's like a room where we keep collecting stuff and then we keep pointing out the room and say, Oh, well, there's lots of space and inside the house we're suffocating, but we never want to get rid of things. Mm -hmm. We pray to look in the house and clean it. And but we say, oh, outside it's beautiful and shiny. Well, inside we go like this. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Uh, I had a, a meditation experience recently, a little mini meditation retreat that I did for myself, where um I was taking a vow of silence and um and disconnected from you know friends and gadgets and whatnot. And then was very it was hard because there was a point that came maybe an hour or two where it, it felt really peaceful at first. And I was like, this is great. And then, and then like my brain felt like it, 
was like tormenting me. Oh, I, like I could not friends. I was doing, I was trying everything. <laughs> I was, I was healing myself. I was like, and I was trying the mantras and like nothing was working. It was, and the, the thoughts just kept coming and coming and coming. And then finally, I just, it was very interesting. I just surrendered and I, I stopped trying to do any kind of technique yeah. and I just sat, um, I just sat upright cross-legged and stared out the window and boom in that moment all the craziness in my head all the voices of shame and blame and all the trauma voices they left and I was just sitting there staring at a squirrel out the window and then the rest of my little retreat was just like completely quiet mind without effort so um I love what you're saying there it's like we we have a fear of going into those places because all the trauma is going to come up and all the fears and all the things that we repress do you have any advice for people like for like um for you know in those moments when you feel maybe some like like a practitioner wants to go deeper like they have a desire to do it but maybe they're not sure how to do it maybe in the midst of like a chaotic busy life maybe their parents and they have kids running around and they have a full-time job like how would you recommend people going to that deeper place where stuff can come up yeah i mean first of all again uh the the, the basis of that is the grounding and the centering you know like for example a tree cannot have this really wide open canopy if the root system is not good so first of all, really making sure that we stay grounded and centered inside our body. Mm -hmm. And it's good, you know, for example, I live on the 11th floor of an apartment building in front of me. It's a beautiful park. <clears throat> and when I first started to live here, some people said, oh, France, now every day you have to walk a few times outside because, you know, that's where you have to ground yourself and because you live on the 11th floor. And I said, no, I have to learn how to ground myself on the 11th floor because that is my, here is my body, right? Mm -hmm. It's not outside there on the ground. So uh, first of all, inside your body, really making sure that you feel grounded and centered. Then just like a mountain, then when things come up, we feel very stable that we can actually deal with it. Most of the time we cannot deal with it because we feel ungrounded. We're more an upside down pyramid. And then when stuff comes up, we... <gasps> We weeble and wobble, but we fall over. But when we really centered and grounded, and this is why in all of these ancient teachings, again, you see working with the root chakra or the hara or dantian or with the navel chakra to first facilitate that. And then slowly, slowly, we can start to clean out. You know, and it's the same, for example, say uh, if I'm in a garden and I uproot a plant and I'm going to repot it somewhere or replant it somewhere. The first thing you do is look after the roots. Mm. Right? So all of these, we can see it in nature. We can see it in these old ancient teachings, but uh, yeah, the first point of call is for me is very important. And I know I say this a lot and I say this a lot to students too. And I say, okay, you hear me saying it a lot, but it's so important yeah. that, uh, yeah, I it need to be said because sometimes we just forget. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Is there anything that, um, that isn't in your new book that maybe <laughs> <laughs> but like because as an author myself yeah. I find it a curious phenomenon that when something comes out into the world and you're like oh like it sparks more things you're like I kind of wish I would have put that in there or maybe it's the seed for the next book like what <laughs> yeah, well, def absolutely I had a uh, I mean this book came out uh the way of Reiki came out in November last year. And so before you write it and then, so it takes about a year yeah. being at the publisher to design it, etc. So in the last year, I definitely had again, certain uh, direct experience where I go, Oh, mm -hmm. um, but uh, to write them down straight away now is in a book, uh, not yet. I, for me, yeah. 
is always, even when I have those direct experience, I need to gain more clarity in it. I see it also a little bit like, you know, when we when we do scientific tests, you do it again and again. You just don't do it once and say, this is the golden rule in this test. No, a scientific test, you do it again and again and again mm-hmm. to see if it always uh, comes up with the same results or not the same results. Mm-hmm. And so it's the same with our meditation practice or in investigation into who we are that we not just once, but again and again and again that we know for a hundred percent within ourselves mm-hmm. this is the truth this is how it really is and that might change again mm-hmm. uh but yeah through that really direct experience uh, mm-hmm. so yeah definitely always things brewing in the back of the <laughs> mind <laughs> yeah uh so i love what you said about scientific Um, verification that we can do. And I think that that is perhaps what sets apart. um, And again, labels and words are always slippery, right? Mm -hmm. But just for fun, I'll use like the two terms like religion and spirituality. Okay, so my experience of religion has been and maybe other people have had different experiences. But for me, religion, I was I was raised Christian. Um, The way that it was presented to me was like, like have faith in what you do not see. There was not really that emphasis on investigation for yourself. It was just like, believe the pastor, believe the Bible. Um, And almost like too much questioning was seen as bad. Um, When I was a a kid, I went to a Christian school and I was always the one that the religion teachers hated because I was always like, I had a million questions and they could never answer to yeah. my satisfaction, I'd be like, okay, where in the Bible does it say blah, blah, blah? And they'd be like, um, <laughs> and and they hated me because I was just disruptive to the way it was supposed to go. But um, so I've, I had this like view of religion as like just blind faith. But then um, I went through a period of, um, I wouldn't say it was atheist, but I was definitely like, I didn't really want anything to do with anything anything like I was very much into the intellect I went and got a PhD I thought that my mind could save me from the craziness of religion um of at least how I perceived it to be crazy and um and then I dipped my toes into the world of spirituality initially um through Buddhism mm-hmm. like around 2008 or something like that um and I noticed right away what drew me to it was like this idea that like it's a sci- almost like a scientific method. It's like, okay, here's some steps. See for yourself. Like the Buddha said, like, don't just trust me, see for yourself. Um, and I feel like with Reiki, the system of Reiki, it's similar. It's like, don't just, you know, pick up a book by Franz Dina and just blindly believe everything you say. Like Absolutely. it's practice, it's find yeah. out, it's testing and verification. So I really appreciate that you brought that up. Um, do you feel similarly in terms of like that being a hallmark of spirituality, the like to the testing and the scientific kind of nature of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it really also depends on the teacher. Sometimes the, mm-hmm. certain teachers make certain spiritual practices more dogmatic, unfortunately. And I think that is because then for the teacher, there's a lot of ego coming into play and that feels nice and it maybe feels powerful. There is certain control, et cetera. And so we also have to be always very careful. Uh, But therefore, yeah, we have, as you say, we have to ask the teacher questions. We have to investigate before we really take on a teacher and in a way the teacher should question the students what is their readiness so you know for example my teacher in Japan before I started to work with him he was testing me he was asking questions he was investigating was I the right student for him uh yes or no and because it's not just uh it's not so easy it's not just where we sit and we close our eyes and we kind of do hands-on healing and we fall asleep. That's more relaxation, right? I don't really see that as a spiritual practice. A spiritual practice is actually 
laying bare your spirituality. What is that spirituality? Laying bare your laughing kindness, what doesn't change according to circumstances. Or in Mikasui's, here we can see the precepts behind me, that we embody the precepts today in all we do. And we all know that that is not so easy. Eh? It's really tricky. Yeah. And therefore also, I come back to an, an earlier kind of question or some phrases you chew up is that sometimes we see our life when we have kids, family, work, etc., as something very different than spirituality. But actually, it is spirituality. We have to embrace it today in my work, in how I deal with the kids, in how I deal with my neighbors, in how I deal with the boss, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we can see that that is actually spiritual practice, it's not just sitting on our little cushion for half an hour and go like, okay, and now I open my eyes and that spirituality is gone. Now I'm going to do my daily life. Mm -hmm. Then we see it as something separate. And I think that's where a big mistake is in a lot of our modern spirituality. Uh, but so therefore really seeing, uh, yeah, that there is a difference between dogma and spirituality and that we have to, investigate for ourselves. I, I always use the imagery of a cookbook. You know, I can read a cookbook and I can believe it, but it doesn't steal my hunger, right? <laughs> I can read the recipe and I can even buy the ingredients. But again, if I don't use it and cook it and eat it, it's a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. So when we think about a spiritual practice, we can look at the book or go for a teaching but if, if that's all, then it's not enough. Then maybe we buy more books or maybe we buy a, a mala or a crystal or we buy something and we put it in a house, but we still haven't eaten. We still haven't applied it. Mm. So therefore we need to sit on that meditation pillow and we need to bring it into our daily life. That is kind of cooking and that is eating it. And the more we do it, the more we digest these spiritual teachings into something today, into something what we can utilize every moment of our day. And then we come to not something as we you said, blind faith, but a faith where we feel it, we sense it with our whole being yeah. that we go, wow, we're tapping into something quite profound here. And then when we look in the mirror, then we can say, oh, Oh, for time, or for six months, or one year, or two years, or three years, mm -hmm. I do have softened my anger. I do have softened my worry. I am more grateful. I am more true to my way, my being. And I definitely am more compassionate without these changes in my daily life. So mm -hmm. then we can really see for ourselves have I integrated into, into mm -hmm. all I do? Mm -hmm. That's such a key word, I think, for spiritual practitioners these days is integration. Yeah. Um, so I feel like, um, depending on, well, whatever your people's views may be, like on reincarnation, there's so many ways to look at it and understand it. But um, from from my view, like many of us living amongst society, you know, in other incarnations, we were monks, we were, um, we lived, you know, very um, secluded lives, or just more um, simple lives. And now, so many of us are born into these like bustling cities and um, very intense social situations. And I feel like part of the beauty of this time is that we're, um, learning how to be the Buddha within the chaos. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this yeah. is where, where we really should look at, you know, like uh, some people say, oh, and you, you see a lot of these quotes and teachings floating about when we, we have to be still, but we cannot sit still 24 hours a day, right? And when are these old teachers talk about stillness, they actually talk about stillness in the mind while we're moving, while we're doing chopping wood, carrying water, when we cook, when we when we bid the family, and in that we can be still with the mind in that. Doesn't mean we don't have to talk, doesn't mean we have to 
sit like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, it in Zen or in, in Taoism, there's these wonderful quotes like, uh, within movement there is stillness and within stillness there is movement or that we actually to have this direct experience is in stillness is very easy um, but that we can experience this stillness when movement that is the most profound element a little bit harder but that is actually where it needs to be wow yeah so Franz, what do you see in terms of rate the system of Reiki as it's like spreading right now across the world? What do you like, do you have insights, f f sort of predictions or um, a feeling of where Reiki is headed, where it's going and how also like how just currently it's impacting the global spiritual culture? Yeah, I think uh, in a way, I think as as teachers in general, uh, we need to hold hands. We need to learn how to hold hands together. I see, I mean, there's many different branches, blue Reiki, purple Reiki. I just give it now names, red <laughs> yeah, yeah. Reiki, whatever, white Reiki. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of these where people say, oh, mine is more profound. Mine is a shorter lineage. Mine is a higher vibration. Mm -hmm. That one is not good. That one is, you know, like this. Yeah. But ultimately, I think to have and to be able to keep practicing and teaching it, we have to hold hands yeah. and realize that we're all on the same path is not really uh, a commercial enterprise. It's not competition yeah. and the more we see it as competition, then we are already off the path. We are already confused, right? Yeah. And this is, I think, also very important to realize. I think during COVID, I saw this a lot, and now still post-COVID, where people feel the need to maybe change what I've been doing, like work-wise, and they say, oh, I'm going to do Reiki and I'm going to teach Reiki. So they might never have practice the system of Reiki before. Maybe they've had a Reiki treatment or uh, maybe they've done level one and then suddenly go, oh, now, nah. but then the motivation is actually to make money. And that is a tricky one. The motivation ultimately needs to be to lay bare your luminosity. And from that, we can actually start to teach. So it's a really important element to, if we can facilitate that shift, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the commercial aspects of Reiki are challenging because on the one hand, we, those of us who have dedicated our lives to sharing this, like, well, we do need some money to pay the bills. Absolutely. And then on right. the other hand, it's like, it shouldn't be the primary motivation. And I really love what you do at the International House of Reiki by offering um, free sessions for people that cannot afford it. Um, and I do the same as well in my practice. So um, could you offer a little bit more guidance? Maybe there's Reiki teachers out there who are trying to find that balance because maybe they are stressed about money. Um, maybe... Um, they just don't know how to navigate that, you know, the the mundane aspect of the money combined with the spirituality and a little more guidance, perhaps. Mm -hmm. on that. Well, I see it a bit like this, you know, ultimately, uh, again, if we look at the word light. So, for example, say there is a, a, a dark mountain. It's night. And then on top, Anya is lighting up this fire. And suddenly we are at the bottom in the village. We go, wow, there is some light up there. What, what is happening? And we automatically are drawn to this light, mm -hmm. right? Because we want to investigate what is happening there. Here it's all very dark, but there is something happening up there. So automatically some people of the village might go, of the town might be drawn to your light. Yeah. And that is really it. The more we lay bare our own light, the more people automatically are drawn to it. You know, like if I don't teach or do hands-on healing sessions, I walk here in town and where I live and then I might have a coffee. I might take my laptop, do some work from a cafe or read a book or do some writing. Mm -hmm. 
And it's really interesting in the last few years, people, they might say, Franz, you, you always look so calm and you, you always are very kind to everybody. What do you do? I said, oh, I teach the system of Reiki. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a business card? And then you know, not so long ago, I was in this cafe and this uh, lady who works in a cafe, she introduces me to her mother. And I talked to the mother for 10 minutes. And a couple of hours later, I get a text from the girl in the cafe who works there and said, oh, my mother really enjoyed talking to you. She said, oh, what a nice guy. And she said, oh, maybe I'm going to book in a Reiki class with him. I always wanted to do this. And like an hour later, I get this booking from this woman. And so because it is ultimately that people can feel it, sense it. So I always say you are the way you behave in your daily life is your true business card, not a piece of paper. It's, it's really the way you behave in your daily life. So also maybe when, when we listen to these recordings or, but not only that, because I can fake to be a nice dude on these recordings <laughs> and, then, and then be a bastard. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but also that we can see when we look at a teacher in their daily life, how do they act? with their neighbor, with their partner, with their friends, with people who are not so nice, what is happening? And then we can really see who are the teachers who are not the teachers, if that makes sense. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. <laughs> proof is in the pudding, yeah. And this is why, for example, you know, I really like these teachers like the Dalai Lama or, or Thich Nhat Hanh, unfortunately, he passed away. But, but mm -hmm. when you look in their daily life, you, you just see this compassion in action you know it's not something they pretend for a day or for a few days or for an hour on an interview but actually yeah. in their daily life you just see it you know how they interact with all they touch and then all they touch everything becomes healing yes absolutely so um before we go into the meditation um, that you're so graciously going to guide us in. Um, cause I want to kind of just end on a, the mellow meditation note without too much more, um, verbalization, but, um, is there anything else that's on your heart that you want to share about the system of Reiki? Something that, um, you know, you think that practitioners or people that are considering becoming an initiated practitioner, you know, something that needs to be said about the system. Yeah, one, I think, very important element, energy follows the mind. So if my mind is busy, your energy is busy. So if I do hands-on healing and I'm thinking about all sorts of stuff, my energy also becomes busy. So it's very simple to check. Uh, if I do hands-on healing and I talk during it, then my energy is also being distracted. If I do hands-on healing on myself and I fall asleep, I'm sleeping. I'm actually not doing hands-on healing. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very, very clear about what we're doing, how we're doing, and how it all works. You know, it's like, uh, I, I'm not a very handy person. So if someone, say if I have to hang something up here and uh, I need to borrow a drill because I don't have tools in my house because it's not my thing. Um, so then I borrow a drill, then I need to know first to know how it works. I need to know why I borrow it, right? What the aim is of the drill. And this is the same thing. So look at why do you practice? What is the aim of your practice? And then how do I practice in a very, very clear way? And one of the core elements of that is energy we can call it reiki or something else doesn't matter light follows your mind and therefore check your mind mm -hmm. amen <laughs> and, and, this is, and this is also why the precepts within the system of reiki are all about the mind yeah getting the mind um well how i interpret the pre i guess the summary of how i think the goal of the precepts is just basically to become more loving people, you know, more, you know, which is the same in all religious teachings and spiritual teachings. So yeah, cool. Well, thank you. Um, 
So I'd love for you to guide us. Um, I, I'm so excited to have a space here to practice um, with all the beautiful viewers out there. Um, so can you guide us in, in, a, in a meditative practice that we can enjoy together? No problem. For how long do you want me to do that? Well, maybe about five minutes. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to do a little meditation practice where we also use our voice because in a lot of these ancient teachings, voice is a, is a link between the mind and the body. So what we're going to do, you sit nice and straight, always use your physical body as a tool as well. So when we sit nice and straight, a little bit open here, we already start to feel more open, more kind, more welcoming. And then instead of we were sitting like this, so nice and open, hands on your lap. And then first take a couple of deep breaths into your belly. So don't try to do it as much up in your upper part of your body, but really bring that breath that your belly is moving. Really pushing the diaphragm down. So sometimes it's called belly breathing or diaphragm breathing or deep breathing into that lower part of your body. You're really using the diaphragm to breathe. That means the upper part of your chest stays relatively quiet. And part of what moves is your tummy. And then the state of mind during this meditation is that you already have everything you need. You're already this great bright light. You're already Reiki. You're already Buddha nature or God essence, whatever we call it. We just haven't realized it yet. And then while we do this deep breathing, we use the sound of ah. Ah. Deep breath. Out breath. Ah. 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 Thank you. 
Sit in that resonance. If you're ready, take a couple of deep breaths and then slowly open your eyes. That was wonderful. Good. Thank you. Mm. Uh, so there are probably some folks out there who are very intrigued by your work and want to connect with you more. So besides buying your amazing book, which is available on Amazon and all the book, well, I'm sure you can get it in bookshops, you know, and if you order it or you, you can get it, it's, it's available. <laughs> yeah. The way of Reiki. Um, besides that, do you um, have any ways that people can connect with you more? Yeah. Uh, my website, www ihreiki.com so ih means international house of reiki so ihreiki.com i'm also on facebook and instagram francino or international house of reiki so you can seek me out there and uh yeah always uh, welcome to also send me an email so uh yeah no problem Cool. Yeah. And I can personally give a recommendation for the one-on-one -on -one sessions with Franz that he does over video chat. Um, they're wonderful um, times that you can just meet with Franz to ask questions that you have about Reiki or just generally about spirituality. Um, he's a very good mentor. So yeah, it was cool. Um, yeah. And for my viewers out there who would like to help me continue making videos like this, um, the best way that you can support me in doing that is to go to my Patreon page, which there's a link below. Um, and it's basically just a way of offering me some support. Um, and then in exchange, I offer some written support back to you. So yeah. Um, so Franz, it has been very illuminating for myself uh, to have this conversation with you. And I truly um, know that you have illuminated the great more of that great bright light within all the, the people who are watching and listening. So thank you for your generosity of spirit and just keep, keep up the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anya. Thanks for inviting me and great conversation. Thank you so much. Yay. Namaste, everyone. 
Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityar Ma Amritan Kamaya Om Shanti Shanti Shanti